is talk about whatever you want to talk about, um, and also the question of hope at some point. Absolutely. For which I have more, I think, than you have. But, I mean, I was going to mention the Children's Community Centre, which we set up, by, what is it, 46 years ago, uh, with the help of the social services in Camden, and getting um, a rundown house because I used to have the meetings with the head of social services when I first met him I said can I meet you on your knees and he went what and I said well then we're the height of a small child and if you look at he was trying to offer me a church hall and I said I don't like being in a church hall this height I don't want to be in it that high so we found ourselves we kept our eyes open we found ourselves a small house but the important thing was I think because this was feminism People assume that, in a way, feminism is selfish. It's just about us. No, absolutely not. Most of us, me and my mates, had little kids. And we have mixed boys and girls. And that was quite interesting, because I still say, I think it's harder to be a good man than to be a good woman. And we set it up not only equally, as, you know, chose our books carefully, did all that kind of stuff, but it was pram pushing distance, it was Highgate Newtown in North London, and cross class. I and mean, we're not supposed to talk about things like that anymore. But I was teaching We're all middle nurse class now. I was teaching nurse and nurses, and you bugger me, I really don't think I want these kids um, teaching my son because they're not taught well enough. And I really like them. Um, and then I looked at the middle class nurses and thought, the class system starts at six months. So middle class could pay and have this flash. The working class went to the state. So I said, no, we're going to have mixed. We're going to have half and half. Uh, if you can put in a day a week, great. If you can't, no. but please come at least once every fortnight to a Sunday night meeting. My, God, my entire life was taken up with meetings, um, running the nursery. And we did, and it was extremely interesting. And you wouldn't have been able to have told from looking at the kids, or until they opened their mouth, um, which background a kid was from, although we did have two or three kids who'd not seen a man, and we had a lovely little... How old were they, those kids? Two to five. So, because their parent, their mothers were sort of radical separatist, or...? No, just people. But, um, but I'm not sure why they hadn't seen a man. I didn't. Oh, no, I was just about to say, two or three of these kids who were like little working class kids, mothers working their guts out, yeah. um, hadn't seen... And one of them is this lovely little Nigerian girl who had this amazing grin and people were completely fooled by it um, and she hadn't seen a bloke and so when the postman came she ran straight with her mouth open straight to bite his balls at which point he'd knock on the door and call through the letterbox after that saying hello it's postman could one of you open the door please and that was that was very funny so it was very funny but I think the cross class bit was extraordinarily interesting because then we started doing things that were like not teaching exactly but experience like sand and water and we had one beautiful um, woman in white gloves on a Sunday night, sitting there watching us to all do sand play, water play, and we're thinking, she thinks we're dark, we're just playing silly buggers. And finally, after half an hour, she went, <gasps> tore off her gloves, plunged her hand into the sand, and made her first sand castle for like 35 years. And it was, and then we had a talk about it, and it was, it was that liberation. It was. An awful lot of people were so suppressing themselves to try to bring up a child that would fit into society, so they got told off a lot, right? So then by the time they get to about three or four, they're, they're sparking back, so they're getting told off more. And um, we had policies of whenever there was bullying, and there was, we'd hug the bullied as much as the, you know, the bullier. Yeah, you know, we'd hug them both. Yep. So, the classic, because by the time the youngest, I mean, they got to five, the ones got to five, but Barney was one of them, and they went to their local primary school. I mean, I remember Barney getting up, leaving the class, he needed to pee, came back, sat down, got told off, for leaving the class without asking permission. We used to have to do leaving classes. When you go to primary school, you may not be able to use scissors, do tie and dye, cross the road with some grass. I mean, you suddenly, they were regressing. I mean, the actual expectation in... The, you know, the primary schools was it low, if, if you like, but it was something I'll never forget. The kids have never forgotten. Um, I won't tell you much more about it, but it was a important that we addressed in among feminism. We addressed childcare because you know you always get that thing of you know your 
men think we complained about them because of whatever. But we realised that the people below us in the system over whom we have power were children. But you had to bring them up properly and you had to bring them up equally. So, and you can't ban guns. I mean, I'm a bloody good shot. Um, and I used to make bows and arrows and wasn't bad on pea shooters. But we never had any anything aimed at. If you wanted to play games, you never aimed at anybody. And so you didn't ban the whole thing, you banned the concept of attack, if that makes sense. There were very few bannings. And then you had the conversation with the kids about why you were doing it. And they understood it. And if you sit down at a level with you know, little kids chopping up their lunch, because they all had to help cook, and you had a discussion, even if the answer didn't come straight away, they'd think about it, and then later on they sit down and say, that wasn't very fair, was it? I perhaps should I have apologised. And because you didn't get really told off, it was... It was an incredibly liberating experience, so that's what I wanted to say. I thought it was good. And uh, when I first met you, like the fact that we went to that conference, whose name I've forgotten, and I looked around... Thought, Change oh, how. Change how. And I thought, there's no, there's no Gresh. It wouldn't have crossed our mind to run something without a Gresh. And the blokes, because we only knew good blokes, ran the Gresh. You know, I mean, it's... <sighs> well, there you go. I was shocked. Hope, hope. Well, I was just going to mention that um, somewhere Noam Chomsky talks about his education and the fact that uh, he went to some experimental school when he was up until the age of 12. And then when he entered the, the normal school system, he was shocked and amazed at how conformist and obedient and how everyone knew, all the students knew where they were in the pecking order. Yeah. Um, and it... Yeah, it's just a reflection there that the school system, famously, and it's been observed, is there to create obedient uh, cogs who know how their place in the machine in every sense. But anyway. Well, I went to a good school, a past 11 plus, because my dad was working class and thought the only way out of poverty and everything else is education. He didn't say it like that. Was he wrong? No, because in those days, I went to, look, I was the eldest girl, I went to an all-girls school, I said this last time, I didn't actually really experience um, sex, it didn't cross my, I didn't know the word, um, but what it didn't, it taught me an amazing amount of facts, uh, off which it was like a trampoline, you could bounce up and down and ask your own questions, but you weren't really taught to ask questions, so... The best lessons that I had were art and English, because they're not so much about asking questions. It's like when someone said, well, you can't judge X because you're, you, know, you haven't committed murder. And I said, I've read Macbeth. I know all about murder. I've read Macbeth many, many times, so I know about murder. It's like, do you have to have killed someone to understand about murder? I mean, shh. The whole point about doing arts is the imagination. And from a, a very, very young age, literally at the nursery, you've got these little two-year-olds acting stuff out. You know, so when you get fart faces running the education system and say, more straight maths, more straight this, and you think, or IT, and you think, I, what are you going to put in IT? You learn IT, and then what? You know, it's, if you've ever been with children or looked at them or listened to them carefully, they are inventing things from a time, almost before they can speak. They're inventing stuff. They're trying things out with their... Shall I buy a strong person? Or shall I offer you your shopping? You know, it's wonderful to watch, especially if you can keep your hands up. You just sit back and just pretend you're not looking, which is the best way of doing it with kids. It's cool. I think it's. Cool. Are you thinking about your granddaughter at the minute? No, not only. I mean, she's brilliant, but I remember seeing a phrase in obviously some David Attenborough thing with lionesses um, looking at after all their cubs, and suddenly one does something, he goes whack. Don't you get too close. And he called it benign neglect. I thought, what? A wonderful phrase. It's a where you absolutely know what your kids are doing. You're not getting involved, only at the last minute if something's going wrong, but you know what's going on. And I thought this is a brilliant phrase. I'll pick that up to use. Right. Um, the hope thing, because I know you think you're a cynic. Um, I'm not a cynic. I think partly it's if you're active in any movement, and I've done it from Vietnam, anti apartheid person, Vietnam and God knows what, um, to be hopeful. If you're not hopeful, you're basically saying my generation is the people that got it together and the next one's down, haven't quite done it. I've learnt from every generation. 
And I think what was interesting for us, there were two or three key massive subjects you either got engaged with or you didn't. And now, if you look, and I've got a couple of mates who say, well, not a lot's going on. I say, bloody go online. There's amazing, because I've been making films about trees and stuff. There's amazing stuff about ecology going on. Very small scale, which is in fact what you want. You want small scale things going on that can't be subverted or owned or possessed by anybody up there or anybody wants to take it over. It's Don't you condemn yourself to irrelevance if you stay on that very, very small scale? You feel good about yourself and you feel pure, but you haven't changed anything. Well, you might have changed something locally and that's good. It's like almost when people go and say, I'm just going to send a food parcel to Ethiopia or whatever. Um, the Ethiopians might actually want to dance that day or do something completely different from what you were imagining. Like, how can I explain this? It's almost like you're here, you go and you want a, a result over there, but you don't quite want them to act like you in your life. Hmm. Well, I want them to be able to have any life they like, which could be inappropriate, funny, daft. Okay, they're probably starving, so um, they can't be as funny as they might like, but... It's a bit like when War Child first happened, which was a charity, War Children, obviously, in among the first parcels that went out, I think it was to Yugoslavia, because I think we were doing, it was at the Roundhouse, um, there were a couple of guitars and some lipsticks, and some of the people in the audience were going, what? And you're thinking, teenage children might like a guitar? And if they're in the war long enough and their teenage years have gone, they've never had a guitar or ever had no. lipstick. And it was a very interesting conversation you could have with people. What's appropriate? Do you only want to send bandages? Or do you want to send daft stuff that's lipstick doesn't sound as if it's important? Well, go back a bit, take yourself out of this and think, what do they need? Or what would you, you know, open up and go, wow, what would make you smile somewhere else? So I think sometimes we are arrogant in our richness, if you like, um, in our desire to do good and uh, fine and give charity, but charity can be warping, I think. In fact, I don't, it's like, I think hard about war and obviously pacifists, but we got um, crowded out by a bunch of squaddies doing women in black and they were kind of saying, what are you doing? And I said, Personally, I think I admire your heroism. I, I don't know if I could do anything like what you do. I think you're fighting the wrong wars. I don't believe in wars, but I admire what you do. And it's not only do I admire what you do, but if you come back maimed in some way, my taxes have sent you out there. And no matter whether I agree with the war in Iraq, which I passionately don't, if you're maimed, my taxes have got to look after you for the rest of your life. And they had assumed that you were either anti-war or you were British Legion and Red Poppies and hadn't realised that there's a really thinking bunch of people saying I, I don't think you should be fighting anybody on my behalf, I don't want you to be but if you're damaged it shouldn't be a charity looking after you, it should be us, the mm. state. I feel that profoundly and that's hardly a conversation that gets had, is it? Do you think? No, I, I agree with you. Right. For sure. Hope, though. Oh, the Malala Emma Watson thing. Yes! That was lovely. It was lovely. Explain a bit for people who don't know. Oh, well, there's Emma doing. Watson, very beautiful, ex Harry Potter, blah, 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 blah. And she gets up, I can't remember which programme awards, saying, here's why I'm a feminist. You know, we get treated differently. Uh, what's wrong with being pretty and whatever? I am a thinking, intelligent human being and I want equality and I want the rest of it. And everyone's going, right, oh, Emma Watson. And you can see a lot of blokes who are quite fancy are thinking, oh, she can think. And then Malala, there was a photograph of her in the week, giving her a hug, saying she, Emma Watson, was a person that inspired her. And you're thinking, that hadn't crossed my mind. Serious little Malala with all these guns and God knows what. And it was Emma Watson, why shouldn't it be? I just thought that was... Wonderful. And the acknowledgement, the public acknowledgement that these two were fond of each other, owed each other something, could learn from each other, could give. It was just so beautiful. But it's not against anybody. You know, Malala's obviously this <laughs> immensely talented, precocious, grown up, humane, you know, human, I don't know what she released, but um, wonderful young woman who you assume thinks all the right things. You don't necessarily think Emma Watson does just because she's a film star. And then you think, 
why shouldn't she think all the right things? It was just inspiring. I loved it. It was an image that if I were a young girl, I'd have on my wall, the pair of them hugging each other. I thought it was beautiful. And I suppose when someone said we were the second wave and there's now fourth wave feminism, I thought, God, I've been out of it for a long time. I've no idea what the third wave was at all. I don't know what waves mean, really. Shall I mansplain? Yeah, <laughs> go on. I'm going to mansplain to the women's liver now. Um, so my understanding, and I'm sure there are people who will correct me, um, yeah. is that first wave was the suffrage movement. Yeah. And once they got the vote, apparently they went away. They didn't, they did. but things died down. Second wave is from sort of early 60s, feminine mystique, you know, Betty Friedan, and followed by Gloria Steinem, your, uh, your crew. And then there is a critique of that that says, well, it's great that middle class white straight women have gotten equal pay and are bumping up against the glass really? corporates. So, yeah, go on, go on, go on. in theory. Um, and then you get at the beginning of the 1990s, third wave feminism, inspired in part by essays written by um, Alice Walker's daughter, um, looking at what we now call intersectionality. I don't think it was it was called that then. But bringing in more systematically and uh, coherently, perhaps, issues of class and especially race, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. huge in the United States. Yeah. And fourth wave feminism, I'm not as clear what's going on there. I think there are all sorts of debates around um, transgender and people getting yeah. into trouble for saying they're not really women and, and Jermaine yeah. Greer catch, catching yeah. it in the neck recently and being no platformed, which I, I kind of think you have to have the debate. So, um, uh, so, so fourth wave I'm less clear on, but third wave definitely from the early 1990s onwards, um, you know, it's not just white middle class women. It never was. I mean, It never was, but at the beginning it, it, it was not by our faults, but by... <sighs> I mean, I can remember filming with Mae Hobbs and she was one of the very few working class women because she was the night cleaners and so we walked close because we're here and Hackney's only over there. Um, and hardly any black women, but hardly anybody we knew anyway. Where I grew up in Surrey, there was no one black whatsoever. Not only that, the policeman had blue eyes and helped you across the road. Um, so yeah, we had, our age group had no experience of race at all till we were at uni or whatever. Um, so it wasn't deliberate. And when we inherited the Newsroom New York films, the radical films, what was interesting was that we saw the Detroit car workers. There were very few um, blacks in the movement, but what they'd done was stub their toes against a glass ceiling and thought, oh, we thought we, were, we could go on forever. No, you can't, just like women can't. But because America was always a couple of years ahead of us, like I, I said on another occasion, um, we sometimes experienced our knowledge of what race did via the states because we hadn't really yet experienced it. There were fewer black people in uh, London at that time. Definitely fewer. Oh yeah, definitely fewer. When I went home to see my parents, nobody. At all. Yeah. So it wasn't to do with fault, praise, blame, you know, did we go searching, blah. No, we didn't go searching because we earned a living, we raised our kids, we did our politics, we were knackered. I remember going up to take these youth centre kids from King's Cross up to Scotland to stay with a commune of mates of mine. And Tina saying, oh, did you know about X, Y and Z? And I said, no. She said, well, it's a few streets away from you. And I said, Teen, I'm looking after kids. I'm earning a living and I'll come up here and I get the gossip from London from you. You know, it, we were working so, so hard. And plus the fact that there were no grants for anything. We made all our films for nothing. So we were earning a living to keep ourselves and to fund the radical politics we were doing. What that did was made us amazingly independent. No one could tell us what to do. Yeah, There's a, an article I'd like to share with you by an American woman called Stephanie McMillan, I think her name is. She's a cartoonist, um, radical cartoons, but the article is about the effect that the foundations and paid professionalization of activist groups has oh i'd love to really. who pays the piper calls the tune ultimately uh, but far more subtly it's not that they're 
over your shoulder every five minutes, but you're no, in the no, back no. of your head, you're thinking, if I do this, does that make it less likely that they'll get another grant to cover the yes. costs of our organisation in, into the future? Absolutely. So you self-censor, whether, yes, you, yes. whether you know that you're doing that or not. Well, in the first Iraq war, we had a media workers group against the war. And um, at one, I can remember about three meetings in, because there weren't very many people from telly. There were lots more from journalism. And I remember going around them and saying, has anybody put in a proposal? None of us had. In the end, Tariq did and got it, because his was pretty polysyllabic. It was late at night. But what was interesting, we'd done exactly that. We'd self centered We'd assumed no one's going to commission a film, you know, anti the Iraq war, which we were about to go into, well, we just started. And it was, oh, we do it all the time. We make a judgment. And I said then, we should be bombarding them with proposals so at least one of them will get in or one of them did. But it's, um, it does, it, it, if it's affecting, infecting the minds of someone who's pretty independent and radical, what's it doing to everybody else? Who went through a very traditional school system as well. It comes back to people learning to sit in rows and listen to the person at the front of the room, aged four or five. And then most yes. politics is like that as well. And most academia, like the two conferences I've been at, well, we'll sit in rows and we'll listen to the expert at the front of the room. I remember going, being done for a um, fly posting, whatever happened to Bill Stickers, um, and going up in court in Hampstead, and you're referred to by your surname, Crockford, blah, blah, blah. My mother was appalled. My mother was appalled. She didn't know anything about the politics I did, but being called by my surname and going to court. And I later wonder... on, five years later... I'm showing her a film about Vietnam um, where, where General Westmoreland has just called the Vietnam Viet Cong gooks. And she says, it wasn't a very nice war, was it? And I said, Mum, why do you think we were demonstrating and doing stuff? And it was like, once something's over, it's safe to acknowledge that something went on. And so my mother's analysis of, the, of history was always five years behind the time, by which time it's too late to change anything. Yeah, there's a, you know. there's a wonderful cartoon of... Um, a guy shouting at the television because uh, saying you low life on American protesters and the protesters on the television are saying the Pentagon's lying about this war and then the same thing a year later and the newscaster is saying the Pentagon admits today that it lied about the war and the guy in the sofa is asleep you know I'll try and dig that oh, that, yeah, that yeah. one out but I mean Jonathan Friedland in today's Observer or yesterday's Guardian talking about the Snowden revelations and people oh, yeah. condemning uh, Snowden a year ago and saying oh this is outlandish conspiracy theory are now quietly That's admitting right. yeah this is this is actually what's been happening as long as you can leave a gap of six months or a year or two years what was outrageous becomes normalized and what's Chelsea Manning still in jail oh for a long time Chelsea will be in jail Oh, it's like we were talking about Vinny they have to yesterday. they have to discourage other whistleblowers. These are these are demonstrating. I mean, like after the London riots when judges were handing down huge sentences, disproportionate. It is pour encourager les autres. Yes, but it's like we're here because we're close to Tottenham. The rioters from Tottenham were sent to jail so fast. It's not true. Let um, me guess. They were black. Uh, most. But that's not so much the point as when I've described, because as you know, I keep going to hospital and everyone says, are you allergic to anything? I say, yes, David Cameron. Um, I said, David Cameron et al. were part of the Bullingdon Club. They would go and eat. They trashed the place, but daddy paid the bill. There wasn't a bill passed to send them to jail. You know, it's, it's like there literally is. We've suddenly got to this weird form of politics. It might as well be the 18th century, where one bunch gets off and then condemns and polarises and imprisons the other thing. How are they getting away? How do we not know enough? It's because, A, we're not taught enough history to have a historical knowledge to do to link the little chains to say, oh, they're connected. Um, There's just no history. We've cancelled history. We've cancelled your... Oh, it's Michael Gove's kind of history, which wears red poppies. Sorry, I, I do feel strongly about poppies. It's Tell us about the white poppy. What does it mean to you? Why do you wear it? It's active pacifism. In other words, you can't just say, oh, I don't like war, really. You've got to do something. You've absolutely got to do it. I mean, it was women after the First World War saying um, not only thousands, millions of young men fell, killed, don't say fallen, but conscientious objectors, civilians, all kinds of people were destroyed by the First World War, 
think by the second and by others, and they all need that level of care and memory. Um, and it's like now, I think it's, some people have only just been pardoned for having been shot for cowardice in the first world war. How long does it take? And you think, to have gone now, of course, half the people that were shot would have been post-traumatic stress disorder, God knows what. You know, we'd have had a name and care for some of these guys. I mean, because I have met people from the Vietnam War who were <coughs> do lally. And then the... American servicemen. Yeah, American system didn't want to know about them. You think, mm. send them off. Then they come back, hang on, we were doing this in the Napoleonic Wars. All these soldiers came back and nobody looked after them. Uh, uh, it's, uh, do we learn anything? It's like Afghanistan. We've been fighting for 156 years there. Never won yet. Dung. You think... Graveyard of empires. It's like, how can we be so clever and so stupid? Okay, so we should probably wrap up, but I want to try and tie those threads together. Um, yeah. Well, more about learning, actually. Oh, yeah. um, there's a wonderful novel um, published by Women's Press uh, called Mud by a woman called Nikki Edwards. And what it does is it combines the... Um, Greenham Peace Camp. Yeah, I was at. And ah, well, that that's okay. We'll talk about that next video. Uh, I'd love to hear all about that. And World War One. And the way that she does it is, uh, it's what is it? Nineteen eighty. Yeah, it's a novel. It's nineteen eighty four. And you have the lead character is a woman who has been involved in Greenham but is now disenchanted. And she meets via an oral history project an, an extremely elderly woman who's sort of 86 or 88, whose boyfriend died, you know, whose who's lover, but not in the sexual sense, her future husband-to-be, had died during World War I. And she has some diaries and letters mm. that were sent back from the front and, and so forth. And the theme of the book for me, that comes out very strongly, and as I said, I'll, I'll send you it, and I'd love to know what you think, is that it's, it's very easy to be against the war, whether it's World War I or the death machine that Reagan and Thatcher were installing, and it's easy to do things that get lots of publicity and make you feel good, whether it's a march or encircling a base, but that actually alienates a lot some of a lot of people, yeah. and it alienates potential supporters. And um, I, very quickly, my critique of um, these people running off to Paris for the climate summit is falling on deaf ears. And what I'm saying is, yes. well, if you go to that summit, you are almost by definition someone who can afford the time, afford yeah, the yeah, money, yeah. and afford to get arrested, perhaps. And that creates an exclusion between it you does. and all the other people who might care just as much about climate change... Exactly. but can't go and do it. So what do you think we've... Finally, the question. <laughs> Sorry. What, do you, what advice would you give to young activists drawing on your experience of feminism and how do we tackle this exclusion-inclusion dialectic? Lang learn, sorry, learn appropriate language. Half my Facebook people are PLUs, like us lot, and the other half are people who I work with or spent time with in King's Cross who are not noted for their left-wing tendencies. You cannot lecture, ever. If anybody oh, no. lectures me at the age of 72, I think, hang on, I don't like this. Um, but you can listen, and you can use their la start from their language and draw out. It's like, I think I said to you, they, they sent around something about, why haven't we got a St George's Day, and they've got St David's Day. So I wrote back saying, well, actually, uh, David was Welsh, and uh, mm, uh, Andrew was Palestinian, and George was... Syrian. So, and George is, oh, I won't go into it all, but it's to do with work from where they're interested in and then work outwards, right? And one of the things they did when they were, they wanted a day, I can't remember the name of the guy that got beheaded by those two, the soldier that got attacked. Lee Rigby was Lee murdered. Rigby. And um, what I did was I wrote back with, because I really do experience some Pancras King's Cross, and said, this area, which has always been poor, has been the centre for welcoming refugees for 250 years. More than Hampstead, St John's Word, blah, 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 you know, individual Jewish violinists or whatever. But not a mass of 
people in need, desperate need of help and support. Um, we should be proud in King's Cross and Pancras of welcoming in really a, a huge amount of people. We, we're the Lebanon of Europe. It, it didn't put it like that. But it's like, you've almost got to, if you're going to discuss, start from something they can be proud of that's happened in the past. That's not them, but their parents, grandparents, blah, 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 blah. Um, and plus the fact they've watched all the films I've ever made in King's Cross, which refers to this kind of generosity of spirit, if you like. Not always, a bit scratchy quite often, not people not talking to each other, but a place that refugees have always known they could go to, like Stoke Newington. There's a couple of areas of London which have been the refugee centres of, of London, so you could always go there. You have to start from where they're at, not where you're at, but from where they're at, sit down and listen. He put the heavy duties thing, why are you against what I think? They've got to come up with something. Then you answer what they think. You know, like their grandparents fought in the war, blah, blah, blah. So did mine. So did my, you know, so why have I changed my view? And it's almost got to be on mm, respect for things you share. And the reason I'm saying this, it's quite easy being female, because when I first went down there, I was so naive. This little middle class girl from Surrey, and they're thinking, what on earth come down here? But I had a little tiny son, and I was on my own. And I trusted them to look after him. And so they started from an area where, what's the most precious thing in your life? Your kid. So you start from that and you work out. We still have conversations that are based on how you raise kids, what are proper values, who should help, family, friends. The whole of that area, despite some of the right-wing rhetoric that comes out of it, is family-oriented, look after each other. If there's problems, even now, 30 years on, people are saying, I've just had a new knee, blah, blah, here's some advice. And you think, you don't always get that from where you grew up in a middle-class part of Surrey. You know, so it's partly not reducing down to a caricature, always starting from where they are, in my view, not taking the moral high ground saying, I've actually acquired a most amazing um, knowledge of left wing blah blah and blah and you haven't, um, which they're waiting for you to patronise them with because they've been patronised by teachers and a lot of people a lot of their lives. And language and accent comes into this a great deal. Don't know what it happens to you in Manchester, but goodness me, it happens in London. Um, so you can get quite far with the right clothes and not open your mouth, right? So I suppose my version would be listen to people a lot and almost anything you've got to offer can be put on the table and not used but be part of the dialogue. Almost anything you're going through. Does that make sense? I think so. Give us an example. I can't write this very second. Next time. We'll s shall we pick up next time where we, we leave, leave here? Off. Keep, always leave them wanting more, you know, cliffhanger effect. Because the older I get, the more I know I know in terms of, you know, facts and whatever. And the more I know I'm learning because the formative years I grew up in aren't the formative years people are growing up in now. So I, I love it. I mean, I, I just find it so exciting. And now I'm going to read the Financial Times, because I only read The Guardian. So now you've said I should read the Financial Times. Well, I said that I read the Financial Times. I'm, I'm getting better at not... Saying shoulds to other people, I think. I see. I think I, I am anyway. Other well, people would disagree. Yes. That's the answer to it. It's like, I mean, I enjoy oh, the classic. Look, I have to tell you the Bean and Common story. It's quite funny. We were doing rough music. You know, like you make rough music. Anyway, we were doing rough music around the edge of Bean and Common, and suddenly there's this code I wasn't listening, where it stops, and what can be heard is Sue having this chat through the wire with this bloke, and so a couple of people on the other side of me are going. What is going on? He was someone I went to primary school with. He was in the Air Force. I said, look, I, I'm not ever dropping a bomb. I don't know the He's a mate. Sorry, he is a mate. But, you know, so he, you know, he went to supper that night. Thing. Who was that bloody woman outside the, you know, doing rough music? Who is she? So he could say, she's my mate, you know, from school, from primary school. Um, and he's my mate and it's like those are incredibly important things because when my sister's boyfriend at one point was practicing tying knots and I said what are you doing? I'm a very good knot tire so I knew what he was doing. He said well I'm practicing stringing people up, after, bank managers up after the revolution and I went supposing the bank manager is your brother and he was going so and I thought oh for goodness sake 
you know, maybe I'm, I'm able to say this, and maybe if I was in the middle of Syria right now, it, this would seem like a stupidly light-hearted thing to say, but I have to believe it. I have to. If, if someone was coming with a knife to attack my kids, of course I'd shoot them if I had a gun or kneecap them or do something, but I can't imagine deliberately going and doing anything violent. Deliberately. Full stop. Any, oh. Anything else you want to add on the, for this video? Well, it's very funny, this is something not connected with it, but when Thatcher was dead or dying or dead and they were thinking about her funeral and there were some very heavy duty, nasty reactions and I thought, no, I hated her when she was a minister, I hated her as Prime Minister. Right now, she's a sad old lady who's not quite there. I don't want anything to do with her funeral, obviously, but I don't want to have anything to do with current denigration. It, it was then when it was appropriate. Not when it wasn't appropriate. But you don't agree. Well, I just think that the state uses these occasions to reinforce its Control. cultural hegemony, for want of a better term, and that the memorialisation were the red poppies. Yeah. For example, and I think they use fairly consciously these these events um, and to airbrush things out of history. Uh, Etc. And I think that if we don't contest them, then we're tacitly. But it's how we do it. Them. People are spitting at her memory. And I thought mm. it's not. Oh. But yeah, there are there are people who go about it quote the wrong way unquote. But I don't think that you leave the field open for for no. the right to. And to be honest, I don't know the right make. answer to it. I'm just bring it up because I felt so disturbed when it was happening. I think I don't like this. Sure. At all. Okay, well, next next time right, we'll know. talk about hope again and myth-making and... Um, Definitely, I'm going to think about hope a lot because I'm hopeful. Good. And cut, as they Thank say in the film darling. business.